This morning I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 11. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy prophecy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with these childish things. It's good to see you here today. It's always good to be with God's family. You know, when we think about, do you remember when you were young wanting to grow up? Always wanting to be older. It, it never seems like at any point in our lives we're ever satisfied with our age, right? We either want to be younger or we want to be older, but we never really get satisfied with where we're at uh, in, our, in our lives. But you know, growing up, it's not always easy because it doesn't happen in an instant, does it? You don't, you're not born one day and an adult the next. It's, it's a process. There are stages, and, and it takes quite a time to get there. You know, growing up in the spirit, growing up spiritually in the family of God goes through some of the same stages uh, as our growing up physically does. And I want us to consider these stages and, and what a person is saying as they go through these stages. And I want you to understand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make comparisons with the physical years. And if I say mention teenagers, I'm not necessarily meaning that teenagers are the ones that are at that spiritual level of growth, but there is a, a, a parallel in the physical life to our spiritual growth as well. And, of course, we begin life, as, as anyone does, with birth, with our infancy. We, and in that time, what we are saying is, help me. You know, at, at the beginning of our time as Christians, we are babies. And as babies, you know, when they cry, their cry is, help me with something, whatever that may be. Help me by feeding me. Help me by changing my diaper. Whatever it may be, they won't help. And so a, a small baby will always be crying for help. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, after Peter's sermon there on the day of Pentecost, after he has kind of made the main point about the fact that they had crucified the Christ, that they had long awaited, they cried out to them, Brethren, what must we do? See, there was a help me in that, in that statement. They wanted to know what to do about what Peter had just said. Help us. Help us fix what we have broken. You know, a baby at birth is helpless. There is so much to learn. And, you know, I think that if we sat down and we wrote at the time that a child is born, everything they need to learn. Can you imagine that list of what a baby has ahead of it to learn as, as it goes forward in life? You made that entire list right there at the beginning, that list would be daunting, it would be intimidating, it would be overwhelming. But we have to begin somewhere, don't we? And so as a baby, we begin, and we start shortening that list by taking one thing at a time. You know, they, they learn to crawl, they learn to roll over, they learn to sleep through the night, right? Just one thing at a time, learn to walk. We take one thing at a time, and that list slowly gets shorter and shorter, as one grows, anyone who is, who is in the family of God was born into that family. John chapter 3, we mentioned in Bible class this morning, Jesus answered Nicodemus and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus there is talking about being born. Not being born, as he answers the question that Nicodemus asked, not being born physically, but being born spiritually into the family of God. Peter tells us, like newborn babies... Long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. That long for there, long for the pure milk of the word, that is to cry for it. Just like a baby. 
Help me understand. Help me know God's Word. Cry to understand it. You know, when we think about children, we think about babies, at that point in their life, really the primary thing is survival. And and many young Christians do not survive this part or this stage in their growth. We look at the parable of the sower and we see that there were those that the seed was sown and they didn't last very long. For whatever reason, their, their heart was not wholly given to God. It wasn't fertile soil. And so the seed did not grow as it should. And so we understand that this is a time in which we will see some fail. Christians, you know, uh, we, we fa- when we fail to help an infant, it will not survive. If we fail to help a Christian, they will not survive this time and begin their growth in earnest. They will not, as we say in regard to physical babies, they will not thrive. And that's what we want to see. We want our physical babies to thrive, and we want our spiritual babies in Christ to thrive as well. And like any baby, they need people to provide things they need to survive until they are mature enough to begin providing those things for themselves. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus in the Great Commission there says to make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teach them. After baptism, he says, teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. There's so much now to learn after coming up out of that rebirth in the waters of baptism. Then we have childhood. In in childhood, the person is saying, tell me. So we had help me, and now we have tell me. You know, childhood is a time of discovery, and some of the best times of our lives, I think most people would say, was when we were young children, when we were small children, and and we were running and playing in the yard, and, you know, we really didn't have a care in the world other than, you know, what we wanted to do, and and it was such a good time, and we enjoyed it. It was a time of discovery. I loved, as a child, going out into the woods and exploring. I felt like I was, you know, 10, 15 miles from the house, and I could still see it. You know, but I felt like I had gone so far. And I, I've actually gone back to some of the places that I grew up in and we just to go back and to see them. And, and man, I, there, there's some times when I thought I was so far from home, but as an adult I walked up there and I was like, I didn't go anywhere. But I thought I went a long way. It was a wonderful time of discovery. I loved to do that. I loved to uh, build things. Uh, you know, it was just like a whole other world to me. You know, for the Christian at this level, they begin to discover the world of the Bible. And, and it's an incredible incredible world to to discover just you know they the discovery of the bible world creates a great desire to learn more when one begins to truly see that world as it's given to us by god i i, I remember you know growing up and, and being you know in my five six seven years old and, and being at this particular congregation and the ladies were so good at teaching and and they instilled so much in me that I, I carry even to this day. And, and folks, we need to thank our teachers because they are there building those foundations in, in our young people for God's Word. And it's, a, it's not an easy job, but it has such an impact. And they don't get thanked enough, and I, they probably don't see. I, I know Miss Minovie Rainey never lived to see all that she did for me. But she did so much. I remember building a, a Noah's Ark out of popsicle sticks. That was cool. That was the neatest thing I ever... I, 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 I mean, it just sticks out in my memory. We built that ark. And, I, and still to this day, I love studying about the flood. I love studying about the ark and different aspects of it. And I, and I think it goes back to, to her class and, and teaching that and, and doing that very visual thing with, with us and, and, and kind of put it in my mind. And it stays there. I remember my teachers making the stories in the Bible real and interesting and the narrative parts of the Bible are still some of my favorite parts of the Bible and the parts that I, I love to teach and I get excited about teach, teaching. And I think it goes back to those early teachers that showed me the world of the Bible. If we fail to ever go through this part of being drawn to the story and to the truth that is in God's Word, I, it will be very difficult for our Christian lives to continue to grow. There must be a sense of of wonder and a sense of awe as we look at God's Word and we see the things that God did. I think it should just strike us with wonder and awe. No matter what our physical age is, it should drive us 
to want to know more. It should drive us forward. And while this stage is wondrous and while this stage is full of discovery, it is also a dangerous time. Because at this time in a Christian's life and even in our physical lives, at a time in a Christian's life, it is a time where we build foundations of belief. Beliefs that are developed at this time are going to be very difficult to change later. You know, there are some in the world that have said that if you give us your children from the time that they are six years old, we'll have them for life. And and, and there's some truth and there's some power actually in that statement. That's not just a statement said. There's some real evidence to the reality of that. The foundations are built here and, and things will be built upon them and it's hard to tear the foundations out if they're not right. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 16 and verse 18, he tells us that we need to take note of those who don't teach the truth. He's talking to the church here. He says you need to take note of those who are not teaching the truth. You need, to mar- you need to mark them. You need to watch them because they are the people that will lead the innocent. That's just another word for the young. Astray. They will build foundations in them that you don't want. And they will be led astray from the glorious gospel of Jesus. They take these curious and excited learners and they tell them lies. And we must guard our children from such things. Then we have adolescents. And I don't think you would disagree with me that the adolescent statement is prove it. Prove it to me. Uh, You know, if you've had an adolescent, if you've had a teenager in physical life, you know that that is just the reality. Teenagers question everything. It's a part of their quest It's a part of their quest for independence. It's a part of their quest for determining the kind of adults that they're going to grow up and be. It's just a part of the process. There's nothing wrong about it. And don't don't look at it that way. You know, I've always found teaching the teen class to be a challenge. Everybody I've ever talked to has basically said something on that line. It's, It's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. I enjoy it. I enjoy the questions that that they have. You know, and some people look negatively on it. Uh, negatively, maybe even just on this mentality, this prove it mentality, but I see it as one of the most needed desires for any Christian to have, and that's this desire to prove it, and to prove it from the right location, to prove it from God's Word. It is the attitude that enables a person to make their faith their own. It would be very easy for me to have the faith of my father, or my grandfather, or my great-great-grandfather, But I need a faith of my own. It's not their faith that's going to see me through. At some point along the way, Nathan's got to determine what Nathan believes. And you have to determine what you're going to believe. Everybody has to do that so that their faith becomes theirs. That it becomes what they live by. We made special effort in North Carolina with our teenagers after seeing years and years of losing too many after they left home. We made a conscious effort to get them their own faith, to help them come to an understanding of why they believe what they believe, and to build that in their hearts. And it made a difference. Because they need to know what they believe and why they believe it. They need to be able to prove it. And folks, if we're going to tell them something is right, we're going to tell them something is needed, we need to be able to prove why it's needed and why it's right with God's Word. Don't ever look down on this prove-it attitude. It's a great attitude. Every Christian needs it. You need it. We need to have a proven and personal faith found in God's Word. And that is important to our spiritual growth. This period in the Christian life will always come just before a person's faith takes a great leap forward in their trust in God. If they, if they go through this and they look to God's Word and they prove it based on what God has said then they're ready to take a great leap in their growth. They are honest in the search and honest with the answers that they find. That personal growth can be significant. This is the attitude in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 that the Bereans had, that the Apostle Paul praised so highly, that they were more noble than those at Thessalonica. Why? Because they said, prove it. They went to the Scriptures and checked what Paul had said against what 
prophecy had told to make certain that what was being told was something that was true and right and proven and therefore worthy of belief. And then we reach adulthood. And the statement is, watch me. You know, this point, reading a while ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there comes a point where we put away childish things, right? And we move on to the adult things. We, we take on those adult responsibilities. And when a person reaches adulthood, they, they take on greater responsibilities and they show a greater stability with their life. That's, that's in our physical life. And we move from being dependent on others to a self-sufficient person who has the ability to not only care for themselves, but to then take on that role that they have uh, benefited from for so long, and that is the role of someone who can give care, someone who can provide for another. As a Christian, this maturity is the same. There is a need to take on greater responsibilities in the church. Maturity will provide for a more stable faith, a more stable Christian life, a more stable work within the Lord's church. And one will also realize that they are models and mentors to those that are younger in Christ. I'm not just talking about younger in age. I'm talking about younger in mature, maturity level in Christ, spiritual levels. Remember, I don't know how long ago it was. But, you know, time gets away from me, doesn't it? 20 years maybe ago when Charles Barkley said, I'm not a role model. Well, Charles Barkley can say that all he wants, but he was. And kids did look at him, and people looked at him and thought he was something. And so you can say you're not a role model, but that really doesn't matter because you are. And we either model uh, things for people to follow that are good, or we model things for people to follow uh, that are maybe not uh, so good. But we can't just stand around and say, I'm not a role model because people are looking at you. I remember a billboard one time that said, you better watch your steps because I can guarantee you someone else is watching them. And that's absolute truth. Someone else is watching your steps. Uh, so we need to be careful how we walk. Young Christians will learn from the example that they see in, in mature Christians. In Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is dealing with things such as things that are matters of opinion like eating of meat and the special days that the Jews may have had. But he also is talking there really about younger and weaker Christians that are watching more mature Christians do things and then it being a stumbling block to them. That a mature Christian understood they could eat meat, but if they weren't thinking about the impact that that had on this younger Christian that doesn't understand it like they do in regard to meats offered to idols, then they're going to eat it in a way that is worship to an idol and it's going to be sin but that mature Christian had a responsibility to them to teach them, to help them to model for them the life that they needed to live verse 7 in Romans 14 Paul says for not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself it's not just about you, it's not just about me it's about others and that can't be avoided my life will influence others whether I like it or not whether it is good influence or not, it will still do it. Chapter 15 and verse 1 of Romans, he says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strengths and not just please ourselves. A mature Christian has put aside selfishness. And he understands that he is to strengthen others, even if it interferes with what he wants to do. Putting aside my, what I want to help you with what you need. And that is the very essence of of agape love. And that's what we're called to be. You know, if you want to, everybody wants to say that they're a mature Christian, but if you want to be a mature Christian, you have to act like one. You have to actually be one. No more than saying, I'm not a role model, keeps you from being a role model. Saying I'm a mature Christian doesn't make you a mature Christian. What you do, what you believe, and how you conduct yourself says that. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul says, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak. And remember the words, words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So that's the context of that. We talk about that it is more blessed to give than to receive, but the context of it is our helping those that are weaker than us spiritually. 
Helping and guiding the weak is giving from a mature spiritual life that realizes that giving from love is more important than receiving in selfishness. It's my life. I want to do what I want to do. Well, you don't get to do that and when you give your life to Christ. It's no longer yours. He bought it. It's His. You know, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live physically, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He's, he's determining the person that I am going to be. You know, at the same time, I want us to understand and, and to be clear on this, maturity is not perfection. Let's, let's, let's make that clear. Just because a person is a mature Christian, and, and maybe very mature, doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect. Yet a mature person ought to be a whole lot closer to some point of, you know, to that perfection that we think about of Christ. They should be a whole lot closer than they were when they were a child or when they were an adolescent. I mean, they should be a whole lot closer. I, you know, there's no reason for a person who has been a Christian for, for 30 plus years to still not have any understanding of the life they need to live. If that is the case, they're not growing as they should. If our life is still the same train wreck that it was when we were baptized, there's something with our growth that's not working. We need to sit down and figure that out so that we can live better for Christ. We are to be, as mature Christians, those that show others how to live. The Bible tells us that older men are to teach younger men. I hope that each of you older men that are here, mature Christian men, are making every effort that you can to reach out and to teach these younger men. I'll tell you what happens sometimes. We get a little grumpy. We're more grumpy than we are nurturing. And nobody wants to listen to a grumpy person. And so we need to put that aside and we need to find that nurturing and reach out and help young men become the Christian men that they need to be. Older women, you are called to teach the younger women. Teach them how to be Christian women. Teach them how to be good mothers, good wives. We need that in the church. We need that in our world. For women to know and men to know how to be good husbands, how to be the spiritual leader in their house. Women to know how to be good mothers. Those are the hands that shape children for their entire lives as the hands of a mother. The mature should have a generational vision to help those who will be active in the church far into the future, far beyond even their life upon this earth. They should be thinking about what they're going to leave behind by their efforts. How are they going to help those that will follow? The need for the mature to be role models for the young is a serious matter. One we dare not neglect or dare not ignore because Jesus made clear the consequences of failing to help young Christians. In Luke chapter 17 and verses 1 through 2, he said, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better... For him, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. We have such a responsibility to those who are spiritually young. And we must take, make certain that we do not cause them to stumble through action, and don't miss this, or inaction. Because I can be a stumbling block by doing absolutely nothing. Christianity is a call to action. It's never a call to sitting. But a call to standing up and doing those things that need to be done. Well, the family of God is a place that has a focus. It has a focus on the growth of everyone at every level. And it is to always be a place where people are lifted up spiritually. A place where they are encouraged to have the best and the strongest faith possible. And may we always be on this great journey of growth together. May we also enjoy the journey to heaven. This is a journey that is told to us is filled with joy and peace. We can enjoy the journey together.
doesn't mean it's all going to be easy. doesn't mean it's never going to be hard. doesn't mean we're never going to have times where, uh, you know, we struggle. But we struggle together. And as we mentioned in class this morning, we laugh together. We cry together. And we walk together as God's family. Where are you this morning in your growth? In what stage of growth do you see yourself? You know, wherever it is, strive to continue growing and seek help from your church family. God put us together not to just sit here on Sunday morning together and worship Him. He put us here together so that we could help each other seven days a week and enjoy this time together on Sunday as we worship Him. That is why we are brothers and sisters. And isn't it wonderful to have a family to grow with and love? Last Wednesday night, someone asked me to tell a story I told, I guess on Sunday I interviewed, and, and it is one of my favorite stories. I, I, I promise you, you'll hear it this morning, and you're going to hear it again probably in the future as the years go by. But I want to tell you, because I think it, it's true, and it's my lesson in, in a story this morning. There was a preacher I knew, a good friend of my family. He preached in a, the congregation that was kind of the main congregation in the hometown that I grew up in. And he went to a business and he, and he saw a particular man there at the business. And he, he told him, he said, I really think you'd be a great addition to our congregation. Isn't that a great way just to, to introduce yourself to people? I, let me tell you what, everybody I see I think would be a great inter, uh, addition to our congregation. We need to tell more people that. He said, I'd love for you to come and visit us. The old biblical principle that Jesus himself said, come and see what we're about. And the guy said, I'll tell you what, preacher, I'll do this because you asked me and I appreciate you asking me. He said, I'll come for five Sundays. And if you can convince me in five Sundays to become a Christian, then I will. So he, he was good for his word. He came on the first Sunday, came on the second Sunday, came on the third, fourth, fifth Sunday. He stepped out in the aisle and he came forward and the preacher sat down beside him on the front seat and he, he, he said, what, what can I do for you? He said, I want to be a Christian. I want to be baptized into Christ. And so the preacher did that. Preachers, sometimes we, we want to know what we're, you know, everybody says we only work two hours a week. So sometimes we want to find out when we actually do something. And he went to the guy's business on Tuesday of that week, and he said, I, I, don't, I don't want to toot my own horn or anything. He said, I, I was just wondering which of my sermons convinced you to be a Christian. He said, Preacher, I don't want to burst your bubble. So that's already gone bad, hasn't it? I don't want to burst your bubble, none of them. He said, I was walking out of the church building on the fourth Sunday. And there was a little lady standing there, and she had her cane in one hand and her Bible in the other. And he said, and they, they had steps in the front of their church, but kind of like this, so they were concrete. And, and they went out to the parking lot, and, and Sister Harville was standing there, and, and he said the people were just kind of ebbing around her. He said, I walked up to her and said, can I help you? And he put out his arm, and she said, would you please? And she, she, took, she put her arm in his, and he walked her down the steps. They got to the bottom of Sister Harville, and this is how she was. I knew this lady. She looked him right in the eyes and she said, Are you a Christian? I hope you are. It's the greatest thing in the world. He said, I didn't even know what to say. He said, I didn't say a thing to her. She just turned around and walked off. She said her piece and she was gone. He said, I watched her disappear into the parking lot. But he said, all week I kept thinking, I kept hearing her saying, Are you a Christian? I hope you are. It's the greatest thing in the world. He said, on Saturday, I decided I wanted what I heard in her voice. I wanted what I saw in her eyes. I wanted what was on her face. She had 82 years to prove her point. I wanted to be a Christian. Folks, the only thing I can tell you this morning, if you're not a child of God is that you're missing out on the greatest thing in the world. The people in this room and the people in rooms like this all around our world today are the greatest people in the world 
because they're God's people. Not because they're so great, but because the God they serve is. And they want to be like Him. And it is our prayer that you get on that same journey too. That journey of growth. I'm growing today. I'm, I've got a ways to go. And anybody that says they don't is lying. Or just doesn't know what they're doing. But I can grow with these people. Grow with each of you. And I hope that you feel the same way. If we can help you this morning, we want to do that. We want to get you to the greatest life that there is. And that's the Christian life. If you're a child of God and maybe you haven't grown like you should... Determine where you're at and begin to grow and move forward in your faith in Christ Jesus. If you need help, ask someone. Because that's why we're here. To be arm in arm, walking together, living the greatest life there is on this earth, heading toward the greatest life that there will be in eternity. If we can assist you in that this morning, we want to do so. Pray that you will respond as we stand, as we sing.